This episode is brought to you by the Complete Concussion Management Continuing Education Platform, more specifically, the Level 1 course, Introductory Concussion Management for Healthcare Professionals. This course dives into the pathophysiology of acute concussion and covers all the things that happen inside the brain immediately upon impact and during the days and weeks that follow. We dive into metabolic dysregulation, blood flow impairments, autonomic nervous system dysfunctions, and heart rate variability, and much more. This course also examines the biomechanics of injury, looking at subconcussive impacts, as well as concussions themselves. We explore the research around concussion prevention protocols, and in particular take a really close look at neck strengthening protocols to examine the scientific evidence in support, or potentially against these programs. In the final module, we take a very close look at chronic traumatic encephalopathy, otherwise known as CTE. This is the long-term neurodegenerative disease that's thought to be attributed to concussions or repetitive head trauma. And we take a very in-depth look at the evidence uh, around this, and we try to separate media hype from the actual scientific literature. This allows you as a healthcare professional to be able to answer your patient's questions more clearly and appropriately with the best evidence in mind. This course is meant for healthcare professionals, but is no means excluded to healthcare professionals. We actually made this course open to anyone. Although the majority of people who are gonna be interested in taking it are going to be healthcare professionals, and we do discuss things at a very, very high level for healthcare professionals, but we also know that there's a lot of people who are seeking information for themselves, personally or for their family members or loved ones who currently have concussions and just want to learn more about the topic. By all means, you are also welcome to take this course. So please click the link below in the show notes for the level one course. Alrighty. Uh, welcome everybody to episode number 61. All right. Of Ask Concussion Doc. I am your host, Dr. Cameron Marshall. I have two things to talk about today in today's uh, episode. Uh, one, well, they're both kind of listener questions. We've had a number of questions regarding a device called the Q-Caller, so we decided to finally include that one. Uh, I think there was a news story about it recently too, so that's kind of why we brought it up. And also we had a listener question come in that um, is kind of an interesting one and it has to deal with some of the pathophysiology stuff around concussion um, but it has to do with the fact that sometimes the immediate symptoms of concussion may dissipate very quickly um, and you know this person is a sideline therapist wanting to know what to do so we're going to answer those two questions today so the first one is the listener question uh, talking about the two phases of concussion they don't actually frame it that way but the question is this I work with a hockey team and have had many instances of players taking a hit and coming off with reports of getting their bell rung. Uh, they express concussion symptoms such as dizziness and headache, but report that it has resolved completely within a matter of a few seconds or within a few minutes. They test normal on the SCAT test, which is a sideline concussion assessment tool, and they have no other signs or symptoms. Is this an automatic removal from play? or should I put them through concussion protocol and suspect concussion uh, because they reported you know, some concussion symptoms. So this happens and it's actually, there's a reason behind it. So concussion, when a concussion occurs, it's due to acceleration, deceleration of the brain within the skull. And when you have that acceleration and deceleration, if, it, if you have enough acceleration and deceleration, you actually get the brain cells to, to stretch and then come back together and kind of the brain, brain kind of jiggles around a little bit. And when it's jiggling, you get a stretching of brain tissue. That stretching, the, if you think about an individual little axon, it's porous. There's little kind of holes throughout it. And when it gets stretched, those holes also get stretched and opened when those holes get stretched and open to a significant degree you're going to get the ions that are inside that neuron and the ions that are outside of that neuron to exchange right so then you're going to get depolarization you're going to get an excitatory type of reaction so you're going to get the impact that causes the stretching and shearing of the brain tissue which then causes those brain cells that are involved to become excited and so there's the the first phase of concussion is called the excitatory phase 
And this is basically an electrical storm that happens. Brain gets hit, gets stimulated, and away it goes into this electrical storm, chaotic firing. This might cause the person to see stars, right? You're not actually seeing stars. What it is is it's random discharge of neurons within you know, the visual pathways, whether it's the occipital cortex or throughout the visual system, you get this discharge. So people might see stars. You may get ringing in the ears. You may feel off balance. It depends on where in the brain those cells are affected. So you get this immediate boom, electrical storm starts to occur, okay? That little electrical storm that happens is very short in duration. You don't really know how long it lasts, but it could be anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes. And then it calms down, right? If you think about it, almost think about it like a seizure almost. You have this immediate electrical storm chaos. Oh my God, I have a headache, I'm dizzy, I'm off balance. And then it subsides. And then you go, no, I think I'm okay. I think I'm fine. So this is the phenomenon that happens. You're a sideline therapist. You're watching the game. Player gets hit, stands up, off balance. You're going, okay, this guy, this guy has a concussion. Bring him off, sit him down. How are you feeling? Yeah, I'm just like, I'm really out of it, feeling really dizzy. Okay, just hang out there for a few seconds. And then next thing you know, they're saying, no, no, I feel okay now. I feel back to normal. And that's because that little excitation phase has now calmed down. But you should still be holding that person out. And the reason is because there's another phase of concussion coming. There's other reasons, and I'll talk about that too. But there's another phase of concussion. The second phase of concussion is because all of all that firing, you actually start to burn a lot of energy. So with that excitatory phase, you're going to have you're going to have this ion exchange, right? In order to reset the ions back to where they were previously, you need to use ATP or energy. So that energy molecule is being used and burned up. So you're burning energy to try and restore the balance of those ions to back to where they were before the injury occurred. Now at the same time, because of that excitatory phase, you have this molecule called glutamate that gets into the cell and brings in calcium. Calcium gets into our mitochondria, which is what produces our ATP. Calcium makes it so that our mitochondria are not producing ATP. So now we have a situation where we've created an ion imbalance, so we have to restore the ion imbalance, so we need ATP, we need a lot of it. But at the same time, we've created a problem where we're not producing as much. So they might have an immediate onset of symptoms that goes away right away. But the second phase of concussion, which is called spreading depression, is an energy mismatch. So your energy levels start to plummet. So even they, they might feel better on the bench, sitting there for the first few minutes, but guess what? A few hours later, their headache's gonna come back, they're gonna start to feel more symptoms coming on, and they're gonna get worse over the next few hours to days because that energy level just starts to drop and drop and drop and drop because we're burning more energy than we're creating. So that's the energy mismatch. A secondary issue is that if you let that person continue to play, if they say, well, my symptoms are okay, I feel okay, I'm gonna go back and keep playing, and if you let them do that, the issue is that it increases body temperature. So the research on, on animal studies has found that if you keep body temperature elevated after a concussive impact, the amount of glutamate that gets released is even higher. If that glutamate level is even higher, you have more calcium, which means you've messed up the mitochondria even more, which means that your ATP function is even less. And now the injury takes longer. And they've actually established a dose response where people that continue to play in the same game for under 15 minutes or people that are removed immediately versus people that played for less than 15 minutes versus people that continue to play for more than 15 minutes. And there's a dose response. Those that are removed right away, right, their body temperature comes down and they recover faster. People that play for less than 15 minutes, they recover faster than people that ended up playing for 15 minutes or longer, but they didn't recover as fast as those who were removed right away. And the theory on this, at least in my mind, is probably due to this glutamate release. 
You get hit, you have an excitatory phase, you have a huge release of glutamate because of the excitation. The glutamate then opens up calcium channels, which draws calcium into the cell. Calcium gets into the mitochondria and we can't produce energy. At the same time, we're burning a lot of energy. So there's an energy mismatch. Now, if you keep playing in that scenario, you have elevated body temperature, increased glutamate, worsening of your ATP production, and you end up having a longer and more prolonged recovery. So it's kind of a twofold process. So, and that's why I called this episode the two phases of concussion. So if you're on the bench and you're managing somebody and they get hit and they display any signs and symptoms of concussion, that's a concussion. I don't care what their SCAT score says. SCATs, you know, has reliability issues to it as well. So if they get hit and they have any type of symptom of concussion at all, you're pulling them out and it's a concussion until proven otherwise. Even if their symptoms go away within a couple minutes, doesn't matter. The injury's already happened. And that drop in energy is coming. It's just not there yet. Okay? And by holding them out, you're exponentially increasing their recovery. By allowing them to go back and play, you're not only risking them getting another injury in a vulnerable state, but you're at the very least prolonging their recovery. All right? Hope that makes sense. So, back to the old adage, when in doubt, sit them out. I hope that answers your question, and I hope you're actually listening because we just did that. Okay. Whew. Next up, the Q collar. Uh, this is a device that goes around the neck and puts a mild compression on the jugular vein. And it was it was being sold by Bauer. Uh, last year and the year before and it was marketed as a product called the NeuroShield. Since then Bauer has dropped it from their product line but the original uh, manufacturers, the original people with the patent on it have started reselling it under its original name which is the Q Collar. And the idea is that the brain is moving inside of the skull. So putting a helmet on, for example, is not going to stop the brain from moving inside of the skull, which is why helmets don't prevent concussions. Because you could put whatever you want out here, the brain is still going to move inside of the head. And that's the whole thing. The idea behind the cue collar is to compress the jugular vein to reduce the amount of blood that can leave the skull. So you're actually keeping more blood and more volume inside the brain itself. So you're creating a back pressure in the brain. So essentially you have more fluid in there. And the idea is that more fluid can create a bigger cushion or a better cushion of the brain itself. So that's the theory, right? We're not getting anywhere by protecting the outside of the head. So let's see if we can protect the brain from the inside. And by doing this, or by compressing the jugular vein, we're not allowing as much blood to come back. So we're creating this back pressure. So the theory is plausible, it makes sense. And there's done original studies using animals that found that um, you know, they were able to better tolerate um, high impact stress, right? There was a reduction in their, the injuries that they would see afterwards. So when Bauer was doing this a couple years ago, they were very, 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 very careful to, to not suggest that it pre prevented concussion. And what they would say, they said something that sounds like, it protects the structural integrity of the brain during contact sports. Which actually means nothing. But it sounds a lot like it prevents concussions. And that's ultimately what the message is to the public. But Bauer gets away from it from a legal perspective because they don't actually say that it prevents concussions but everyone in the world interprets it as a concussion prevention tool, okay? Why can't they just come out and say that it prevents concussions? Well, because the device has never actually been shown to prevent concussions. The research that's been done using the device has typically been done where they'll have people undergo what's called a diffusion tensor image scan at the start of the season. Then, Half the group will wear this device throughout the season as they go through hockey, soccer, football, whatever it may be. And then at the end of the season, they'll give everyone a diffusion tensor image scan and they'll look for differences between the two groups. 
Diffusion tensor scans are, um, it's an MRI type of machine, and it measures the diffusion of water molecules in axons or in brain tissue. Now, if you think about an axon as a long, you know, tube-like structure, inside of that you have these things called neurofilaments and microtubules. Now, what they do is transport things from you know one end of the axon to the other. So it's kind of the communication with inside each brain cell. And water will diffuse along the axon. So typically will water should diffuse in the direction of the axon. So it's parallel to the axon. And if there's damage to the axon, it it will allow water to diffuse perpendicular to the axon. So the theory is if you see water diffusing in a way that's kind of haphazard and not in line with the axon tissue, the idea is that maybe there's damage to the structural integrity of the axon itself. Because now you have water leaking out. So rather than water going this way, it's now going this way, which potentially shows that there's damage to the outer part of the axon or whatever. So the problem with diffusion tensor imaging is that we actually don't know what we're looking at. They found diffusion tensor imaging findings in people with low socioeconomic status, people with major depression, people with post-traumatic stress disorder, people with ADHD, people with all sorts of different things will show deficits in diffusion tensor imaging with no trauma whatsoever. So a lot of the studies are looking at this saying, okay, well, if there's damage or if there's, you know, we're finding DTI findings, that's related to concussion. And the research has actually shown that we can't really rely on diffuser tensor imaging to make any type of assumptions or recommendations because we don't actually know what it is or what it means. The studies that have been done with the Q call or what they do is they'll take a group of athletes and put them through a diffusion tensor scan. We don't know what it is. They put them through it. Here we go. Here's their pre-season scores. Then half the group gets this device half the other half doesn't wear it. Then they go through an entire season of playing contact sports. No concussions happen. So in any of these studies, they don't have any concussions that occur. So these are all people that are non-concussed. At the end of the season, they put them through their diffusion tensor scans again. Then what they do is they say, what did the group that was wearing this collar look like? And what did the group that was not wearing this collar look like? And what they find uh, across these studies is that the group that was wearing the collar has less changes from preseason to postseason than the group that wasn't. So what they're saying is that the collar itself prevented all the sub-concussive impacts, all the little hits, from creating damage because the brain was better protected. But because we don't know what diffusion tensor is looking at, because we don't know what we're actually seeing, we can't actually make the comment or judgment that the cue caller protected the brain in any way. But that's the theory. So I think from a whole, the idea itself has potential, right? I think we need to start thinking about something other than a helmet, right? We know that you can wrap whatever you want on the outside of the head. The helmet is to designed to prevent skull fracture. That's the purpose of a helmet, not to prevent concussion. And in fact, it shows that it really doesn't prevent concussion. So we have to think about something differently. So I think the idea and the concept makes sense. I think that the research to date is extremely limited, but um, it, it has potential. I think that we need to study it a little better. I would suggest uh, to the researchers studying this, what would be definitive for me would be put the collar on half the people and put have half the people not wear the collar but then go out and put instruments in the helmet to measure acceleration. So now you're actually measuring acceleration values. So then what you can do is follow these groups over a period of a few years, see who gets concussed and who doesn't, and at what forces they're getting concussions. Because if you see that concussions are happening, and typically these studies show concussions happen in a range of 70 to 120 Gs, if you see the group wearing the cue collars taking hits up to 70 to 120 Gs and they're not having a concussion, that's showing that you're able to better tolerate extreme forces without having concussion injury. That would be a little bit better of a study for me. And so far they haven't done that, and I don't know if that's on the horizon or anything like that, but so far they haven't done it. So to me there's also, because you're compressing the jugular vein, you're potentially creating issues going on. So think about if you have an undiagnosed aneurysm, right, which is a weakening or a ballooning of one of the arteries in your brain, and all of a sudden you put a back pressure on that and then you go out and exert yourself. What's that going to do to that little aneurysm? Well, it's going to expand it even more and potentially create a dangerous scenario. 
So I think that there's certain risks and I wouldn't necessarily be running out to buy one until the evidence actually shows that it's going to be protective for concussion, which it currently does not. So at this point, we're talking about an idea or concept that's interesting, um, potentially a bit of a gimmick, maybe beneficial, but we have no idea and I think there's certain things like risks that have to be ruled out before I would recommend doing it. And that's it for that. Any questions coming on? No questions. All right. That's it for today. See you guys. Bye. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. Just one more thing before you go. Are you suffering from concussion symptoms that just aren't getting better? Maybe you're in the wrong place. Maybe you're seeing the wrong healthcare professional. Visit completeconcussion.com slash find dash a dash clinic to find all the local professionally trained concussion rehab individuals in your area. Each of our partnered clinics have gone through extensive training on concussion assessment, management, diagnosis, treatment, and rehabilitation. Uh, they're going to work with you to try and find the root cause of your symptoms and then develop a treatment plan and approach to help get rid of them. If you don't know what's driving the symptoms, you can't ever help or hope to fix them. CompleteConcussions.com slash find a clinic. They have a 98% patient satisfaction rating and have a higher net promoter score than Amazon, Apple, and Netflix. CompleteConcussions.com slash find a clinic. You will not regret it. Thank you for listening to the Complete Concussion Management Podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe and let us know by leaving a review. Have questions about concussion management for future episodes? Submit them to our website, Facebook, or even Instagram. See you next time.